Army newsreel, celebrating its second anniversary of service, speeds up production to a weekly schedule. Sergeant cameramen of the Canadian Army film unit shoot the stories for its production. On far-flung Canadian battle lines, they graphically record history in the making. Soldiers, specially trained in the camera art, they travel with forward troops to be on the spot to record the action. The film is taken from the camera and bagged for shipping to England. Dope sheets are prepared, giving full details of the story. The film bags go to the main press camp. From there, transport planes carry the undeveloped negative back to England. On arrival at the airport, a dispatch rider rushes the film to London headquarters of the film and photo unit. It is developed, printed and censored. Censor cuts are made in the film library, where a full record is kept of every shot for future reference. The film editor, having selected stories for the current issue, the sergeant film cutter and his staff prepare the individual items. Thousands of feet of film are viewed each week to make one edition. Expert hands splice hundreds of sequences together to form a reel. Soldiers taken from various field units and CWACs make up the newsreel staff. Many have had civvy movie experience. Once the silent reel is made, sound effects and background music are built on the soundtrack. Moviolas are used to see and hear the results. In the recording theater, the newsreel goes to press. Sound effects, background music, and the voice of the commentator are welded by the film editor and the sound engineer into a finished reel. Copies are made, and the shipping department dispatches them to wherever Canadian forces are stationed, to Italy, Holland, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Produced by, of, and for the Canadian Army, the Canadian Army Weekly Newsreel is your newsreel. Its job is to portray faithfully the life of Canadian soldiers wherever they may be. They are shown from frontline theater to headquarters in Canada to keep you posted on the deeds of Canada's fighting army. On the Channel Coast, the last remaining German pocket of resistance still holds out at Dunkirk. Czechoslovakian troops under the command of the 1st Canadian Army keep the garrison on its toes. A ring of steel surrounds the city, so there is no hope of escape. Surrender is only a question of time. At Bray Dunes, a village in no man's land, Jerry snipers occupy buildings. Czech mortars lay down a smoke barrage to blind the enemy while our patrols prod forward to chase him out. Patrol activity alone keeps life amusing. Soon, Captain Schneider, Nazi commander of Dunkirk, will run out of vintage champagne and sauerkraut in his deep dugout. Then we can expect capitulation. It's moving day for the Canadian Forestry Corps. They are off from an English port with all their heavy equipment for employment on the Western Front. There's lumber to be cut and trimmed for army billets and for the reconstruction of shattered towns. Canadian lumbermen are just the boys to do the job. In Belgium, close to the borders of Germany, camp is set up. Firewood is first in the program, then the job of felling the fine stand of timber. The operation is just duck soup for the old time lumbermen from all over Canada. Their only complaint is that Belgian trees are just sissies compared to the tall babies they are used to tackling. three scotch mills are set up. 24,000 board feet of lumber are turned out every day. As important as the man behind the gun is the lumberjack behind the peavy and the saw who turns out the wherewithal to build for peace.
the Canadian mill underway, 70,000 feet daily will soon be rolling out to rebuild blasted homes of Belgian allies. With old man winter rearing his hoary head and the weatherman talking about plenty of snow, Canadian jeeps don snowshoes. In Canada, production lines have been busy and training has been in progress for possible flurries in northern Italy or western Germany. And we do mean snow. Remember it? A valuable addition to Johnny Canuck's issue of rolling stock is the snowmobile. Weighing a ton and a quarter, it is made from tough Sitka spruce. A 95 horsepower engine makes going easy, even over the most difficult ground. rugged, the snowmobile is the perfect answer to a white Christmas. James, just shoot the skis to the old jalopy and let's get cracking. In Italy, the problem of recreational runs for forward troops off duty has been solved by the enterprising RCASC. They have inaugurated the nickel cab bus line. Tunable trolley is right on schedule. No pushing in the queue, lads, just clamber aboard. You'll be off to see the bright lights in just a moment. No plush seats or chromium trimmings, but the three tonners leave from forward areas every 10 minutes. Don't worry if you're at the wrong end of the queue, there'll be another cab in a minute. Still another Canadian has been awarded that most coveted of all decorations, the Victoria Cross. Major David Curry of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan is the recipient of the honor. General Prerar congratulates him on receipt of the good news. Major Curry is a squadron commander of an armored regiment. He is decorated for the outstanding part he played in the saint lambert belsur Deve offensive. This opened the last phase in the drive to close the Falaise Gap. Standing his ground despite fierce counterattacks, he advanced to invest his objective. By this time, every officer of his small force had been killed or wounded. His conduct will forever be an example to the entire Canadian Army. Still clad in battle-stained dungarees, Major Curry is rushed directly from the action area to Buckingham Palace to receive his decoration. The Canadian tank, which came ashore on D-Day, rose forward with its original crew toward the German frontier. Still going strong after the hard-fought miles, it joins elements of the 1st Canadian Army as they cross for the first time onto German soil near the town of Beek. On the exact borderline is mute evidence of successful invasion. A house which was the property of Hermann Goering's aunt, Frau Schuster, is now ours. It is still under Jerry fire, but Auntie doesn't live here anymore. Today it's one foot on the fatherland. Tomorrow, with both feet firmly planted, it'll be curtains for the crouch. <laughs> 